All right, we're here for a special edition of Clean Tech Talk with founder Scott Cooney, CEO Zach Shahan, that's me, and head of everything else, Derek Markham. <laughs> IT, editing, all kinds of stuff, Derek's uh, sort of go-to man. Um, so we just recently hit our 16-year birthday on Clean Technica. Yeah, it was we sort of... We just barely missed doing an event last year for the 15, but we thought, okay, sweet 16, we would do some special stuff for this, had an article about it. And uh, we were talking about doing a podcast this week about, you know, how the clean tech industries have changed since we started in this field. So we're sort of going back 16 years to start of Clean Technica. But each of us might have sort of a different sort of starting point or focus area that we're focusing on uh, for the comparison to 2024. Um, and yeah, there's just a lot has changed. We're always in the weeds of covering the news every day on Clean Technica. And sometimes you step back and you're like, wow, the big picture, like it's just really good and actually very fulfilling sometimes to look at the big picture. And just sort of recognize and appreciate how much we've how much we've achieved, how much the world has changed in a positive way. Uh, so, yeah, starting with with Scott here on on you know just what are your kind of memories of two thousand eight or two thousand ten, and you know how much different that era was than today. It's that, you know, it's a whole different world, you know, as we were, as we were thinking about prepping for this episode and thinking back to where I even was in that, in that time frame and kind of what I was talking about at the time, you know, there were, there was, there was an organic food movement. I think that was starting, you were starting to see a little bit of that. Um, ironically, uh, Derek and I went to the same natural food co-op a long time ago uh, in, in Fort Collins, Colorado. Uh, in a in a whole previous life, and Derek, I mean, if you remember that, but it's you know it's it's astounding to see how far the food movement has come. Where now Costco is the number one purveyor of organic foods, right? So the environmental movement and how that can, can you know turns into consumer culture has has radically shifted so much. It's kind of incredible. And then obviously on the clean tech side, when we started Clean Technica, you know CFLs were so exciting. It was like you you had a you here's your here's your chance to reduce electricity use from from a light bulb and you know it's just change your lights you'll save the world it was just like oh my gosh this is amazing and it, they it were literally so took me a moment to realize what a CFL was right was like, yeah <laughs> we've been talking about them for so long and I've thought about them because my house has them it it just came with it. And they're, you know, they take a long time to turn on. So I think about, yeah. but I was like, CFL, what's a CFL? And I was like, oh, and CFLs, it, yes, yeah, of course. Fluorescent light bulbs for the, for those who don't even, who missed that entire episode, you know, they, they took the long tubes that used to light up a, an office, you know, and, and give that horrible like office quality light. And they wrapped it up into a little bulb that you could like jam into a, into a regular socket and uh, and replace an incandescent bulb, and it was it was all the rage for a little while. Even though it was full of mercury, it it flickered. It took forever to turn on and warm up. The light quality wasn't great, and and I think they were so expensive when they first came out. They were they were insanely expensive, but the electricity savings was pretty legit. You know, it dropped a sixty watt bulb down to a thirteen watt bulb, and provided you know in in a minute or so, it it would provide the same amount of light. <laughs> So, you know, to, to think about that today and how, how much lighting has changed. And now you're seeing these like 20,000 LED light displays, you know, at, at, at venues that, that use less electricity than, you know, six incandescent bulbs or whatever. It's, it's kind of astounding. Um, so, yeah, so, and the, the technology, I mean, I used to drive a, a biodiesel Volkswagen Jetta. And I remember thinking biodiesel is the future. It's so exciting. You know, we, we can... We can we can harvest plants and animals and grind them into like something we can put into a fuel tank and drive around town. <laughs> Everybody would ask, does it smell like French fries? And I was like, no, it's biodiesel. It's different. It's new age. It's, it's technology. <laughs> it's astounding. Yeah. So I don't know. It's the world is completely, completely changed. Derek, what do you think? 
Wow. Yeah. Completely different world. I was just, I shared with you guys, one of the early articles I wrote on clean technica, like 2009 I was living in Colorado at the time. I got an invite to the Aspen environment forum. So I went up there. I think we saw an early, I think it was a Ford focus or fusion. I like an early, I think it was a hybrid. It was like this huge new thing. We went and saw this presentation, uh, about this, you know, the future of hydrogen. Um, this guy out of MAT invented this art quote, artificial leaf you could basically put a unit in your home and split water into oxygen and hydrogen and then run, run your home off of it and like the tagline was like you know run your home for like um, five liters of water or something like that and just looking at where hydrogen has gone like there was a lot of hopium as uh mike bernard likes to put it about hydrogen at the time because no one was really i don't think anybody at least on the blogging side uh, and the green and clean tech media, we weren't really looking at, is this feasible? Is this viable? Um, so I found that, I, I thought that was pretty funny. The other thing, um, one of the things I covered a lot in the early years was consumer tech. So portable solar chargers. And so even a little unit like this oh and God. a little tiny battery, pretty expensive. And you know, they were decent-ish um, compared to now, 2024, I mean, you just, you can't even turn around without running into a portable solar panel and all sorts of, uh, you know, uh, portable power stations that are affordable. I mean, even home energy systems. And right around there, I was doing some home uh, solar installs for a local company as well. And it was very elite. It was very bougie. You had to have quite a bit of money and no one was putting home energy storage in it. And if they were, it was only if you're off grid and then it was like lead acid batteries. And it was still a huge amount of money. And to, you know, fast forward to now, and we've got all sorts of, you know, EcoFlow and the t Tesla Powerwall, it's no big deal. I mean, it's still a little, you know, low pricey, but um, I, I find that fascinating. And the same thing with vehicles. Um, we went from, you know, maybe this hybrid thing is a thing to now all the major automakers are putting out EV, well, almost all of them. <laughs> Hybrid's a dirty word now. Right, right. right. <laughs> Wait. Yeah, well, and, and I want to say there's still a lot of hopium around hydrogen. Like I said, that maybe yeah. that's one thing that really hasn't changed is there's still a lot of bullshit out there yeah. about hydrogen and like oh, this is the future. I, I think the motivation maybe has changed and and where that stuff is coming from has changed, but hydrogen yeah, is still I, sort of this. I was trying. I don't remember when it was. I remember looking at a National Geographic in like my my in my house and it had a an ad for like the you know gm ad i think for you know you, you put hydrogen in, nothing comes out the water whatever it only only emits water vapor whatever and i think it was the 90s or early 2000s it was one of the one or the others who yeah high school or college and i mean it's the same basic pitch it's the same basic like like they they hardly change the message because that's 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 what captures people's imagination and attention. It's just it's a very the technology has this way of like, oh wow, that's so cool. And it captures people, pulls them in, and it's and you know, some people, you know, get deep into it and dream about the hydrogen econ hydrogen economy uh for decades. And <laughs> but it's it is funny that it's like the same that's the one thing that's sort of the same is the hydrogen PR <laughs> yeah. pitch. From the 90s or early 2000s to 2024, you know, 20 to 30 years later. And uh, it's pretty wild. Yeah. And, and Derek, you had a specific like M MIT, you know, it was an MIT thing. It was like, like, I that don't was know. a legit like the professor. Weight, the weight yeah. of this, into this technological, you know, behemoth powerhouse MIT saying this is the future. You know? And uh, yeah, well, when I when I try to go back to the beginning of clean, it's, it's funny because right now, like I can barely remember what happened in the morning or what we covered in the morning or yesterday. There's just so much. My, my brain is full, but the early days of clean technica, I can still remember vividly because it was new and fresh and it was all this whole new world. It was, you know, it was exciting. And um, like the first year I, I was writing on the site, like mid 2008 to the mid 2009, I would just write like four articles a month, like from my head about, sustainable lifestyle, green living, you know, the connection between spirituality and vegetarianism or, or uh, d breaking habits, the, how the biggest challenge to a greener life is, is finding ways to break habits. And, uh, and it was like, that's all like, I didn't know anything about clean tech news or green news. And it was like, 
after a year, um, there was like a bonus one summer, like uh, you write 40 articles and you get like a $500 bonus. And, and I was working as an English teacher in Poland. I'd moved to Poland for love. I met in graduate school, a Polish lady. And after a year, I moved over there after running a nonprofit in Charlottesville, Virginia, focused on sustainable transit and, and bicycling and sustainable development. And I was like, oh, it's summer. $500 was a lot in Poland. Uh, how do I write 40 articles though? Like, how do you do that? Like, where do you find the stories? So I had to like find all these sites, like where you get green news. Many of them are gone now, <laughs> they no longer exist. And uh, and yeah, I just started to, you know, write any news story I could about green stuff. And, um, and then I was like, after a month, I was like, wow, I could like really do this as like a job. You know, this could be a job. Like part and and so then I started doing it, uh, you know, part time, but a lot for a year. And then in middle of 2010, uh, I was asked to like just run Clean Technica to take it over to be the director of the site. And um, and I, actually, before you know, I got into clean, I, I started. I wrote about solar energy once or twice, and and someone was one of the editors then was like, you know, that should really be on Clean Technica, not Planet Save, where I was writing or Sustainable Blog. And I was like, oh, I'm not a technology guy. Like, I'm not really a... And I, mean, I got pushed to write there. Then like a year later, I got pushed to uh, to run the site and uh, never saw myself as a tech guy, but I always felt like our job was translating techy stuff to normal people. And I, I feel like that's where we've always done pretty well. But yeah, I remember a few topics from back then. I remember writing about solar, solar blowing up. And I remember that vividly because people, some people complained that it was clickbait, that I was given the impression that solar panels were exploding. <laughs> and I was just saying that the, the, the industry was blowing up, that it was getting big, you know? And that, that's why it sticks in my head because back then you're very sensitive at the beginning to like criticism. It, over time, you trolls roll off your shoulder like water, you know? But uh, <laughs> I, I was like, I still, it still in, had an imprint big enough on me that it comes to mind immediately when I think of that time. But uh, but the funny thing is, it was like it was exploding. The solar industry was growing so fast, so big. If you look at a chart today of 2010, 2011 solar versus now, it looks like nothing. It looks tiny. But at the same time, like SIA, the Solar Energy Industries Association, they were putting out, you know, these forecasts quarter after quarter about how the, the industry would grow like really fast over the coming years. And there's big growth, big bar chart forecasts. And I think it even grew faster than they were forecasting, but it, it at least followed that trend. So it really did, you know, people didn't, a lot of people didn't believe in it. You know, it's like, oh, that's the Solar Industries Association, or whatever. These are solar fanatics think that solar is going to become something. It was like less than one, it was like 0.1% of electricity production in the US. Like, you know, so it's just, if you look at it, like last year, it, it was the top source of new capacity additions in the U.S. grid. It's it's becoming the num like the biggest one of the biggest sources of electricity um, and the biggest source of new capacity. And uh, it's just it's crazy how much it's it's grown. Um, and we've covered that whole period. We've covered all that, you know. But at the same time, it's like you look back and you're like. Wow, we were excited about like nothing. <laughs> I mean, at the same time, you had to have that to build it. But but at the time, like the the amounts were tiny compared to today. But we you know we saw where it was going. We we were, had faith. Um, but also like we wrote wrote about high speed rail, and and I remember Obama driven by Biden, big high speed rail plan for the for the U.S., which got sort of kiboshed and and uh, sort of sabotaged by Republican governors of certain states who wouldn't even take the money to build the high-speed rail lines, you know, like free money for the state. So we went through that period of like, oh, this is the future of transport, of, you know, long-distance transportation. And, you know, eventually we got into electric vehicles, like, you know, in 2012, like it wasn't even something we covered before, before you know, for a couple few years. Um, and it's amazing. I mean, is how much that market has become. I mean, there's so much to say about that market. I'm not even going to start, but but I I do think it's funny that the same hydrogen pitches that were made like back then, and there was a real debate like, what's the future, hydrogen or battery electric? Uh, like it's the same pitch today for it, but it's like embarrassing because it's they obviously lost. I mean, it's not yeah. <laughs> it's not gonna not gonna break through, dude. Like they were so uncompetitive even back a decade ago, let alone today. But anyway. 
that's sort of there's more so many stories come to mind but the, the sort of just we've just come a long 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 way like evs yeah, didn't exist pr practically solar was e-bikes e-bikes were like e this fringy do diy thing and now they're like they're everywhere yeah yes. let's talk about e-bikes for a minute I, Sarah, derek you go ahead and start scott and then i i have a funny story on that too Man, I think the first e-bike that I rode was actually a conversion kit. It was a super pedestrian, I think it was, the Copenhagen wheel. Um, and it was weird and clunky, and it replaced your rear wheel, and they shipped me a loaner unit. Uh, it took me a bit to get it on my bike, and, you know, the battery is in the wheel. Like, nobody, the physics of that just does not, like, from a, a reliability standpoint, it didn't make a whole lot of sense to me. But it was easy, you know, it's a drop-in thing. Um, put it on a little single speed that I had, and I was like, oh, game changer. But the price of that was the price of a new bike at the time. And now for the same price of that one wheel, you can get a pretty decent e-bike that, you know, decent amount of miles um, that has plenty of bells and whistles up to, you know, you've got like the big three bike makers, you know, specialized in Trek or putting out these high-end e-bikes. Uh, if you want to drop six grand on a bike or ten grand, uh, but for the average person, thousand bucks, you get a pretty nice e-bike. Two two thousand bucks. But back then, it was there were guys. I remember reading about guys who were doing the DIY thing, and and I I think I covered uh, an e-book or maybe it's probably a physical book at the time of how to convert your bike to an e-bike and people using even lead acid batteries like the little motorcycle batteries to power them. I mean, it was super clunky. I mean, you really really had to want to do it um to to build it and now man it's it's wild i i think it's beautiful um but the micro mobility thing with i mean electric skateboards were a thing for a while they're not yeah. i mean unless you ride a skateboard they're not really a thing um scooters and the little quadricycles now it's it's kind of amazing and mostly battery tech and motor tech has enabled that we've got the prices down to the point where it's not going to cost five thousand dollars for a little motor in a battery pack for your bike i think that's really exciting but that that copenhagen wheel was like an internet sensation for like five years it was like always yeah. coming up on stumble upon or dig or whatever or, you know the, the social media giants of the age and it was just like everybody would get excited about it and then you know as time went on it's like why aren't they selling these why aren't these why isn't this not like a big business now and, and over time you're like this doesn't seem like it's going to turn into an actual like business success like like what happened and there were stories what happened to the copenhagen wheel and stuff and uh yeah it's i don't know i don't really know that full story of what happened to it it just i guess like you said it wasn't the most maybe practical or best solution with the tech um in the end as maybe i feel like they pi they pivoted into electric scooters or something but yeah i don't remember the exact details but the super we pedestrian should, brand is still around i think we should absolutely run a series like where are they now you, you ever see those like documentaries of like a, a famous actor from the 90s and they're they're no longer on anyone's radar and like they do these where are they now things and they show the guy and he's got you know he's hanging out smoking a lot of weed living near a beach and just like has you know just kind of a retired life and you know he's gained 60 pounds and he's like yeah whatever you know life is different now <laughs> We should yeah, do that we with should. like we a should. bunch of clean tech companies that were just all the rage. What was the um Bloom? You remember the the yeah. hydrogen right. battery pack thing? Yeah. Bloom Energy. It was the biggest thing for so long. Yeah, I don't know. You guys remember that? Am I Mr. Yeah, yeah, I remember Is that the, that the little portable one? Yeah. Little tiny yeah. unit. Golly, I mean, I I'm back I'm by sure gate. We had an interview with like the then CEO of, of uh Bloom on Clean Technica somewhere. We could try and find that um actually you oh know we're, we'll add some really interesting uh articles to the show notes uh, for this for this show i think there there should be some real doozies like derek you, you mentioned the the mit professor before we'll put that one in the show notes that that would be really funny to see but uh yeah i mean the, these things that came and went um it, it's hilarious like derek you the, the micro mobility thing is is crazy now you go to any big city Oh man, the bike lanes are full. Just whoosh, 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 whoosh. these people just going 25 miles an hour, you know, cruising by traffic that's sitting still on a one wheel or on a, you know, a little skateboard or on some sort of e-bike, whatever. Um, I, do they have powered unicycles now? I don't, I don't know, but it's probably. 
I think even five, six years ago, they were still sort of an outlier. I mean, I yeah. bought, I think I bought my cargo bike. I have a rad wagon, um, would ride that all around town. And I was sort of the only, I mean, I live in a small town, but I was the only person that I ever saw on an e-bike. And now they're everywhere, especially older, the, you know, boomer generation and above. But it's phenomenal. It was sort of like, oh, you're cheating. And now everybody's doing it. I'm like, no, it's not, it's not cheating. You still got to ride the bike. But so Yeah, well. So yeah, you have more on that before I have a story. Yeah, I mean, h- hilariously, uh, before Clean Technica and everything that we're doing now, uh, one of my the the previous uh, roles that I had, I was selling advertising for a uh, um, a green business directory, and this was like a print edition green business directory. We ended up printing a book that was 250 pages, like a green version of the yellow pages. And one of our main advertisers was this company called Ecomoto, and I'll, I'll have to look them up, see if they're still around, but they made these like e-bike conversion kits. And Derek, like, I, you're right. Like, I remember the, the e- I, you know, I even got like, I had free barter with him, you know, it was like, okay, you want a half page ad in the book? Like we could, we could barter some stuff. And he was always trying to get me to get this conversion kit with this battery hub that you had to like mount onto your existing wheel and it never made sense to me and it cost like $2,500. It was insane. You know, and I was a bike commuter. I was a dedicated bike commuter at the time. You know, I was like, I was all about like just using my own muscles to go places and stuff. And so I was like, no, I'm good. You know, I don't really need this thing. And God, you look back at that and it's like, now you get these foldable e-bikes that go 25 miles an hour, have a 60 mile range and they cost 700 bucks. You know, you're like, whoa, (laughs) the technology has, same thing with solar. The, the The price has come down so much. The the efficiency has just gotten so much better. Like everything in clean tech is moving really fast and getting so much better. It's awesome. Yeah, it's it's funny because sort of the the learning curve, the, the experience curve from lithium ion batteries scaling up for laptops and phones is sort of yes. what enabled electric cars a bit, and then electric cars using them brought the price down. You know far more like it's like a fraction of what it was so that enabled the e-bike you know kind of revolution but it it's funny because my so going back a bit far my my master's thesis at the university of north carolina chapel hill was on bicycle transportation and bicycle travel uh how different different types of things would affect transportation uh different types of bike paths or bike lanes or bike parking or whatever and i did a comparative in in the netherlands and in in maryland and then so from that i got a job as a director of a nonprofit in charlottesville virginia focused on like i said sustainable development transit but most mostly was biking and at the time like some of the cool cool like things that were starting to bubble uh in that field were bike sharing and colored bike lanes. These were two that I was really like, this is the future. And bike sharing ended up being really becoming a huge deal. And I felt like, see, I knew that was going to be huge. Uh, we tried to implement it in Charlottesville, but couldn't get it um, going. Well, yeah, limited. But um, but one of our board members for a nonprofit was all about e-bikes. He was so big on the e-bike idea. And like these were some of the first, first e-bikes. And I was like, yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, he was like, you know, it's good for older people, people who can't, who, who need help, need support. And I was like, yeah, but, you know, just bike. And I was like, come on, it's not that hard to just bike, you know, <laughs> like, like, I don't know. I was like, you know, a young guy. And I was just like, I, I wasn't really thrilled with the idea of the e-bike. I wasn't against them. I was just like, yeah, they'll have, I guess they'll have a place. But this guy was nuts about them. And man, was he right. He, he was way more right than I was on the bike sharing or the colored bike lanes, which are are bigger, much bigger things now. And I love the growth of colored bike lanes around the, the U.S. and the world. But bike e-bikes was the thing, man. And I mean, you saw they start to rise, start to rise. And all of a sudden, everywhere, like everywhere I go here in southwest Florida, not exactly the best place for biking. Someone's on an e-bike like you almost never see a normal bike. But you see electric, you see, uh, you see all of these different Aventin, you see all these different e-bikes. Like that's that's all people are using now. And I mean, I get it. I'm 42 now. I'm, I'm like my knees sometimes. Like I'm not biking up that hill. Like I'm getting, <laughs> I need the pedal boost, you know. So I'm all about it. But uh, or I'm you know sa- saving my legs for tennis later. I'm like I don't want to be fried when I go play tennis later. <laughs> you know, but. It, 
but anyway, it's it's just that that's been huge. And and now even in places like the Netherlands, where I was for a half a year, where I met with my wife, um, they're struggling. Like, how do we deal with these really fast e-bikes that everyone's using now? Where you where they already biked like the town I was in was sixty percent bike commute rate. Like they already had a ton of bikers, but um, now they're like dealing. How do we deal with them like scooters? They already had a problem with scooters, but now it's a big problem because there's so many people use e-bikes. But anyway. We can we can leave the e bike, but I I think that is one of the sort of uh, bigger bigger trends that we've seen sort of really in the past past few years bubble up. But uh, any other big ones, any other big like then and now, um, either companies or uh, technologies that you guys feel like we got pitched in the clean and green media a lot of vaporware, a lot of stuff. Micro wind turbines was the thing. And I think a lot of us did not really delve into the math and the physics of it. Does it really make sense? But it was like every other week, somebody was launching something on Kickstarter or Indiegogo and these little tiny turbines. Um, and it, we weren't as discerning. I feel like now we're a lot more discerning on Clean Tech yes. now. We're really looking at, is this an actual bona fide company? Do they have a, a product? Does it make sense? But I, I feel like the wind, I, we still get a bit of the wind turbine stuff, like not the wind turbines on the yeah. on your house and all sorts of weird stuff that does not make a whole lot of sense. And then, I mean, you name it, like the hydrogen thing, all sorts of like home algae energy systems. And um, I mean, it was like sort of like the Wild West, you know, it was like new and different. I mean, I feel like, and the media then when the internet was, I don't know, say it's young, but youngish. Uh, Fewer publishers, all battling for the same amount of traffic. So clickbait was king. And if one person covered it, then everybody else covered it. And so it must be legit because it's on the <laughs> internet. Yeah. So, which I guess goes on still a bit now, but um, there's a lot more clean tech, you know, the companies or media companies that didn't cover clean tech, um, just like the big like car and driver, you know, car things. Now they're covering EVs where it used to right. be very niche. So it's, really, it's getting really hard to stand out, I feel. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. a really interesting point too, Derek. And I mean, obviously, like my, my background's more in the business space. I have an MBA. And so I, I have come to Clean Technica sort of as, as like the, you know, sales side and the operation side and stuff like that. And, and I, I have particularly, I've gone to a couple of ad tech conferences and I've, I've sort of tried to make sure that this is a viable financial model, Clean Technica, you know, going, going forward and. Um, the media space has changed so much. It's it's really fascinating. And yes, back in the day, it was just like you had to cover stuff. Otherwise, you were just left behind. And so we were not as discerning. And, you know, now I feel like we're, we are, like you said, so much better. And one thing I'll, I'll also note is that we have always had a really beautiful um, agreement among everyone on our team that we would not take advertisers we didn't believe in. That was that was something from from day one. We wanted no greenwashing on our site. We've never taken money from Exxon's or Chevron's or anybody that we would not agree with. Um, there, there are definitely some that are like, you know, they're they're not pure, pure, pure companies, but they're doing a lot of great things. And it's like, okay, that's that's cool. But we would not run a program and promote stuff and do any ads or content marketing for anybody that was doing pushing anything that was like not good. Um, we had one really interesting moment last year where our, our ad sales guy sold a, um, an, a package to a company without really realizing kind of what they wanted to promote. And it turned out it was hydrogen. And so then we were like on the hook to do this. And then we went back and forth a bunch. How do we you know, do this and make it, make it right? And we ended up publishing an article that we tried so hard to like, you know, be well, clear and transparent. Well, there's stuff and then you know golly we just got skewered the comments and the our audience did not like it at all so it was good to know that a lot of people see us as a way that that you know that if it's advertised on clean technica it's going to be a pretty good part of the clean tech revolution and it's and it's a pretty legit offering um yeah, much well, like with hydrogen now we're much more discerning with hydrogen there's there's um there's a lot there's so much in there so much nuance so much. because because like it is not a it's never going to be a viable solution for for cars for small transport that kind of stuff right and because there's been so much hype from that especially from automakers there's been a lot of pushback but then people who have really delved into it mike bernard michael liebrick uh you know mark z jacobson 
they leave an opening for like, oh, it can be useful for fertilizer for perhaps depending on who you talk to, perhaps long distance shipping, perhaps long distance trucking, depending on who you talk to, you know, heavy equipment, and, maybe like some, yeah. some real niche kind of stuff. And Michael Liebrich has like a ladder, like, you know, definitely not, maybe, you know, it definitely could be that kind of thing. It's a very popular um, take on that. And uh, so you have to have nuance with it, but then you have a lot of people who just fall into the, like, hydrogen's horrible and it's never going to be useful for anything because it just fell into the, the flip side of the hydrogen hype, which is like hydrogen sucks, you know? And so, so it's hard to get the nuance line. I mean, we tried to cover it well. And then you've got like big organizations like RMI, right? which, you know, very well respected for their research, their dis discernment, and they're heavily behind hydrogen lately. So it's like, um, it's gotten quite complicated. Like <laughs> it's got, I mean, it's, it's, um, and not necessarily RMI, but like the, the media outlet they bought, um, right. which is a notable big clean tech media outlet. And, um, it's been advertising hydrogen stuff. It got a big hydrogen advertiser and a lot of content. And it's like, it's weird because it hasn't gone away. They've gotten more clever with how it's marketed. Um, same with carbon capture and storage, similar kind of story with that. But um, but it's it, they've gotten much more clever with how they market it and and how they get into places. But uh, but yeah, with the small wind turbines, those still resurface here and there. And Mike Bernard, I mean, one of our he's 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 been knocking this down for a decade or, or longer. I don't know. And he had like a really epic piece of, like a decade ago or something on cheetahs, leopards and whatever, like w small wind, kite wind, different things and why they made no sense. And this was at a time when Google had like bought uh, this kite wind company. Uh, and like, there was this, a lot of excitement about all different things that could be the future. And I mean, he, I, I edited the article and I remember like, yeah, this is never, he's, he's right. This is never going to work, but Google's still behind it. And so-and-so is behind it. And this is behind it. And I mean, it proved out he was right. <laughs> and they dumped it eventually after years of dumping money into it. And um, he, he resurfaced that a while. He was like, maybe it's time to just, you know, republish that with a little update, you know, <laughs> because like, it looks like there's a little resurgence in some, some uh some of these things and uh, i was like yeah let's r r do it again and you can say how right you were you know <laughs> which mike loves to do <laughs> loves loves to point out that you know he was he was skeptical and you know <laughs> did the engineering and the math um when others were not so big props to him for that but yeah and um the media landscape yeah the media landscape is a world of difference because everybody covers it now tech sites car sites yeah even political sites like everyone covers clean tech now and yes, um yeah. reuters has a whole section on climate stuff and yeah. it's more news and a little bit less tech but it definitely covers some of that stuff and and it's google has changed its algorithm so much in the last 15 years so it's like they really shut out the ability for smaller newer sites to do it to get any coverage it's all right. like legacies gets priority and and um it's uh, it's I'm not really a fan of how Google has changed over the years and how the media landscape has consult. I, there's pros and cons because there's tons of conspiracy theories that have spread on small news sites and blogs and social media and giving more prominence to legacy established companies helps to keep that out. But then at the same time, you have, you have less competition, less diversity, less opportunity to like have a, have something else going on and so i'm a little not really happy with where where the, the internet media landscape is but um but all in all i guess you gotta be happy that clean tech has become such a big thing across all of it that's i feel like the because of the way that this has been consolidated the this uh i feel like the information that maybe the the general public might come across it, like say hydrogen right they might come across this thing. Of course, that's the future. I had my uh, one of my sons came home from middle school. I was telling, he was really excited, telling his mom all about how hydrogen, hydrogen, hydrogen. I was like, you know, <laughs> but the teacher saw something on Google or you know Google News or something, and then that becomes the reality for people. It's sort of like the you know the soundbite quality of, of the news. If you don't dig into the details, um, you know, or things go viral by how we you know we share information these days through social media back. In 
2008, 2009, it was, it was the wild west, you know, and, uh, people were, things were going viral that made no sense. Didn't make any sense. Technological, like small wind turbines and hydrogen. And that I feel like it just did such a disservice to people, especially like if you're in school and you're thinking, I'm, what's, what am I going to study with my career? You know, Oh, hydrogen, you know, like, where are you now? Yeah. Super, super interesting. And, and, you know, when you, when you think about it, the, the, the amount of misinformation that's floated around for so long, some of it very purposeful and some of it just because of what we're talking about, you know, that these crazy ideas spread and that things, you know, it's something that's exciting. And if you don't know any better, you're going to share it on social media and stuff like that. And the you know, challenges, you guys probably saw the, the social dilemma that that great documentary about how social media influences public opinion and, and stuff like that. You, you see one piece of misinformation, it takes you six pieces of corrective information to overwhelm your initial belief if you believe that. And so, you know, when you have that combined with the fact that people want to believe certain things, then they really concrete themselves into an opinion. And then it's really hard to shake them out of it, no matter what the evidence, science, all this kind of stuff. And it's just too easy these days for somebody to become a TikTok influencer or a YouTube influencer and spout a bunch of BS and have a bunch of people following them because they want to, because they want to believe what the person is saying. And I think that's one of the fundamental challenges that we that we face in clean tech because obviously, Derek, you, you saw it in real life right there. Somebody comes home and they've got this thing and they're like so excited about this idea and, and personally, like as, as we go through our journeys as you know, I've been kind of a lifelong environmentalist. I know you guys have been too, you know, seeing this stuff in your personal life is like, really, you see it and you're like, oh God, no, come on. You got to mm, ah, yeah. hang on. Let me send you a few articles from clean tech and kind of like set the record straight kind of thing. And, and it drives me a little bit bonkers, you know, and, and watching, you know, these things happen and play out in real life. And it's interesting, you know, a year or so ago, I had a, friend who was weighing a decision between an EV and a, and a gas car and, you know, it was talked out of things at the dealer, you know, the dealers were literally, were pushing them, uh, he, the CV, I, we don't know, you know, it's like, we don't know if this is going to be right or whatever. And, and I kept saying, just buy a Tesla because, you know, that's the easiest, they're the best, they, they know what they're doing, whatever. Like, if you want to cut through the BS, like that's the best way to do it. And the person ended up buying a, a gas guzzling SUV and you, you, you just go, oh, facepalm. Like there was such a, you know, an opportunity to like create infrastructure that's clean versus create infrastructure that's not. And then, you know, you think about the, the repercussions of that and it's, you know, 20 years of supporting Vladimir Putin with, you know, one third of your oil purchases. And it's like, oh, it's like so frustrating. But then, you know, flash forward a year later, I have another friend going through the exact same decision a Subaru versus a, a, a Model Y. And the thing that, you know, and her family has always been a Subaru family. And so she was like pretty, and I was like, ah, she's going to buy a Subaru. But then at some point she ended up buying the Model Y. And, uh, you know, I talked to her a little bit about it without trying to like, whatever. And then, you know, the, the thing that got her was dog mode. You know, she, she has a dog and she just like fell in love with the idea that you could have dog mode in your car. And so the, you know, the clean tech revolution has gotten to a point where we're addressing the things that are convenient for people, whatever. And it makes it easier now for a lot of people to just believe the good things are good. You know, when yeah. CFLs were just the worst sacrifice you made to like save the planet, <laughs> to, to yeah. save the planet, a little, a few kilowatts here and there, you know, anyway, go ahead, go ahead, Zach. <laughs> yeah, no, the social media side, I mean, has me thoroughly depressed and concerned for the future of society because totally. like, I just, I, and I've watched, oh, I've watched tons of, uh, of long discussions from experts on it and there's no clear solution. There's right. no like... I mean, there are potential solutions, but they're as unrealistic as, you know, a unicorn landing in my, in my uh, podcast studio. Like it's, <laughs> it's just, uh, it's not. Yeah. We're never going to go back. <laughs> yeah. And there's, and yeah. like, oh, you, they could do this, but obviously they're not going to, cause that would hurt the revenue. Why wouldn't they? Yeah. And it's like, so it's like, oh my gosh, it's so hard to have any, it's, it's like, we're not built for this scale of information spread you know, as a, as a species, like we're not built for this scale of communication and, and ability to get in these giant bubbles. Like, like if you live in a small town, like maybe one other guy will talk to you about some weird thing on the internet, you can find a million 
who will, yeah. who, and you'll be feel like it's this this is normal this is the world as we know and about yes. anything and so you just and and like you said it's what people find what they want to believe and that's often not the best strategy it's for, for strategy you know have a reality the, based the, life. Is, uh, the confirmation bias you know it's like if you if you're if you're already biased towards something and then somebody confirms it for you, you're like, clearly, you know, it doesn't, doesn't matter if this person's an expert or not. It doesn't matter. It's like, oh, all I need to eat are rocks for the rest of my life. This person said, I, I love rocks. The and earth is flat. Rocks my whole life. Man, it really like scrapes out your digestive tract. I, it has a lot of hard minerals in it. I think that's good for you. I mean, honestly, people will believe anything Dude. they want to believe. And you're just like, no, there's probably a big <laughs> society online for eating rocks uh i'm not even not even joking <laughs> like, it probably it, there there's one uh, you yeah. know there's a flat earther society Why yeah not? I, I mean there's society. people who 2024 who think the earth is flat they're convinced of it like how is it possible it i don't know but they must get into some bubbles on the internet where they convince each other of it and i don't know how they do it i don't want to know like it's, it's Lead poisoning is a terrible thing it's but on the second top the second thing you highlight i think that is that is huge like where I live, you just see EVs everywhere now. And you see people who, as far as you know, have no connection to this world, getting Teslas, getting electric Mercedes, getting electric Hyundais, getting electric everything, Rivians. And you're like, yeah. and the biggest question I have, like every day when I'm out there and I see so many of these around, like, like I just saw a new a parent driving a new Model X who wasn't driving an electric car before. And I, I, you know, vaguely know this person, same, their daughters in the same grade as one of, or same class as one of my, my, my daughters. And I'm like, like, how did they get into it? Like, this is my question every day. Like, how did they get in? How did they get convinced to get an electric car? Because it right. used to be like a, you know, you had to be in that world and you had to be convinced of it and, and you were like excited about it. Now, like anyone will buy one. <laughs> They're just because partly it's just been normalized. And I guess that's, that's what you highlight. That's the key is a lot of these things have been normalized now where it's not like it's not a big deal it's just like oh do you want a new electric car yeah why not it's and it's not like oh but what i mean there's still there's still a lot of questions about range and and charging all that stuff but it just becomes so normal that normal people do it without a lot of research or reason for it yeah um, we're definitely and, on uh, like the upward slope of the s curve there's yeah we're on it's it, a funny you know? it's advertised yeah. on the Super Bowl in so many ways, you know, it's like all the all the car companies are making them. So it's, it's now it's much more mainstream and acceptable. It's also like much thanks to all those early adopters who bought yeah. the roadsters and got things going and gave people rides. Um, 2018, I took my first ride in a Tesla and it, it blew my mind. The, uh, the salesperson, clearly not allowed to do this, put it in ludicrous mode, just, just to show it to us. And oh, they were encouraged to do that. Oh, were they? Yeah. <laughs> he told me, Maybe. he told me like, okay, don't tell anybody, but I'll, I'll do this for oh. you. Okay. Well, I don't know. Maybe that was his yeah. sales anyway, tactic. Sales, a brilliant sales tactic. I still didn't buy one from him at the time, but I was still driving my, my biodiesel Jetta at that point. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So, so like, yeah, he puts in ludicrous mode and like, I, I actually, it was funny. It was a, it was a Valentine's date that I went on and, and, and it was, uh, I, I brought a, 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 a lady who's very green and I, and I, uh, I said, all right, we'll go test drive one car and then we'll go to dinner and we'll go test drive the next car at the Tesla dealer. And we did and put it in ludicrous mode and I still have the video of it. And it was just like, our face is just like, <laughs> just like absurd speed, you know, and, and, and those things tend to change people. And so the early adopters got it. The technology got great. Now it's pretty mainstream and, and you see people like that. I'd be really curious to actually run a little survey of people like that who are first adopters of something like a, like an electric yeah. car and say, you know, what was your journey like? Oh, see, I want to survey all the people out there who are like, just got one in the past year or two. And I'm be like, why did you get like, how did you find out yeah. like, what got you into them? Because they just, they fascinate me because i know they're a different breed they're followers whatever but like you said like every car commercial i see almost is for electric car now for the past couple of years like because they all want to be seen as a leader in this field so that when this anyway even if they're not selling a lot um and the other things like solar ads like i am so sick of solar ads like i used to be excited wow it's a solar ad now i've i've heard so many of these annoying solar ads i'm like sick of them but i'm like well it's good it's normalized it's in everyone's subconscious, you know, everyone knows you can save money with solar potentially, you know, 
Um, so I don't I don't think they're as well done as the car company ads. But like there's just a lot of less well uh, produced um, ads out there on solar, which is a challenge. But um, but yeah, it's just it's all become so much more normal. Uh, that's my my final thought is it's 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 a positive and it's also like in some ways I'm still I still wonder about how new people come to these now and also how we get to you know, 90% adoption, like how we go from here to there. But I think it's just a natural process at this point. I mean, we still do what we do and we try to provide the best information, reviews, best. Um, we have, we have, you know, often 15 years or some 10, 15 years of experience to like give people proper advice and proper, you know, context on stuff, which I think is very useful. But uh, yeah, Derek, you. I was just going to just briefly, I mean, I live in a small town. There's three copper mines here. Uh, open pit, right? They're ugly, whatever. Totally necessary in the electrification, right? So formerly Phelps Dodge, I think it's Freeport, McRoran. I can't remember what they're called now. They actually have a billboard up in town that um, I can't remember the tagline, but it has this futuristic looking electric car and basically saying, you know, the future, we need this copper. So I feel like that's very interesting because typically the mining industry is, you know, I'll say, I don't say the good old boy, but it is a totally different crowd, you know, and it's the pickup crowd, um, which is a topic for a whole other podcast, I think. But, um, you know, these are the guys who roll coal on the Prius on their way to work in the mine, but the mine is actually promoting how they're going to be green for the future. I just, it's fascinating to me. It's funny how, you know, back in the day, the environmental movement was pretty anti-mining, right? And so now as environmentalists, there's a lot of times I'm pretty pro mining, you know, I'm, I'm just like, you know, we just found the world's biggest lithium reserve was literally just discovered. Yeah, it's it's so mind blowing that that's that's like still happening in the world. And it's like in Nevada and it's in the United States. So it's fantastic for U.S. manufacturing and all that kind of stuff. And it's like mind blowing. And that was something instead of being like, oh, God, they're going to start mining again. It's like, oh, sweet. We just found a huge deposit of lithium. This is this is great. We can make a, a ton more electric cars. So that was yeah, pretty a, exciting stuff. It's a challenge because you have the kind of you have the push and pull on that now because you ha you need it obviously for and this is a much better future than, but I mean nobody wants a mine in their backyard or or you know yeah. a lot of people just will immediately be more opposed to mining for copper or lithium or whatever than than fossil fuels and burning them. But um, copper is a funny one because it's a huge part. It's already a big industry, but it needs to get humongous because it's for the motors of electric cars, it's for charging stations, it's for wind power. It, it's funny because it's a big industry in Poland, and my my wife's dad was like a, an engineer at a copper mine, like head of mechanic of the machinery, like like repairs and stuff in Poland. And uh, and we met with a copper organization when I lived there for Clean Technica because they were like, "Look, this is huge. Nobody's talking about this, but." you have to you know we have to do something you know we never found out a way to partner they were sort of hard they were like they were keen on talking and talking but then didn't really have a plan but it, but it was this copper organization like people don't realize copper is the future with clean tech and i was like it's like interesting you know so it is there's it, it's a resurgence in some industries it's a it's a new world for other you know it's a it's a it's a new whole industry for some things um like uh I, graph, I mean, yeah, there's there's others like graphite and and um, other things that need to really grow up, not just expand. But um, but yeah, it, it's just it's crazy to think, you know, it's it's just if you think back what we're recovering in 2010, 2008, 2008, whatever, it's um, we've come a long way, baby. Right. <laughs> we really we really have. And, I, you know, it's it's interesting. You know, you, you talked a little bit before about like how social media it's like it's a beast and it's out the you know the train has left the station and we it, it's like hard to see how this gets better um but it's interesting zach i I've, I've seen a lot of um people returning back to analog versions of things reading physical books many of my friends are joining book clubs they have some nostalgia around this stuff and i think people are starting to do a lot more reflection meditation journaling and like just realizing the digital world is like overwhelming to us so I feel like there's a big resurgence towards that, which is which is really cool and getting off your phone. I have one friend who is like one week a month, I'm on social media, the rest of the time I just get off. 
So I think people are doing a lot of that kind of stuff. So I think that's cool. Um, and then, you know, think about it this way, like Clean Technica, we, we ran the Google Analytics at one point. <clears throat> We've had over a half a billion page views on our website since, uh, since our inception, which is unbelievable. You know, it's like, it's a, it's a real testament to you guys and to everybody who's written for us and shared us and all that kind of stuff. And we've influenced so many lives. So, I mean, as a, as a foil to like some of the BS that's out there, Clean Technic has had an incredible influence. And I, I don't want us to lose that in the in the grand scheme of things. Crazy story. I, I had a guy I ended up living with for a little while who he moved in to the same house I was living in. I had no idea. He was just kind of a cool dude. He, he had worked for Tesla. He worked in solar installs and he was doing permaculture type stuff. He'd kind of evolved his career and wanted to be outside more. And, uh, and so, you know, we were talking at some point, he's like, well, oh, so what do you do? And I was like, oh, I do this thing. And he's like, oh, what website? And I was like, Clean Technica. And he's like, you're kidding. And I was like, no. And he's like, yo, my professor in college, like used Clean Technica to like teach us stuff about solar and wind and all this kind of stuff. And he's like, literally, that's how I started my career. He said, this what got wow. me into solar. He started working for, um, it's a nonprofit that does the low income solar roof um grid alternatives and grid alternatives yeah so he started working for grid alternatives um his whole had a whole career he ended up like selling a bunch of teslas he was a really good tesla salesperson like it was like, i was like you're kidding and he's like no it's 15 years ago i was like oh my god that's so cool Oops. so we we've changed so many people's lives for the better and we we're just going to keep doing that that's what that's what clean technica does it's what every one of us gets up in the morning and says this is what drives us to, to keep doing and so we can continue to be like a, a a bastion of hope and you know inspiration and keep people driving in the right direction and keep that s curve going right and at some point we'll hit inflection points on so many of these things and you know then it's like okay cool we're the the train has left the station like solar it's like it's so it's like we don't even need to talk about solar anymore. everybody accepts that solar is awesome now like it's not it's not a question anymore you know and evs is basically getting to that place and wind power is kind of getting to that place yeah so it's to... Cool, cool to see that history of of what we've done here I need to send you some stickers for your car or, or maybe get some more shirts. <laughs> but, yeah. but yeah, okay. it's crazy. I mean, I've said before, I think on a podcast, there was one, I mean, we're still small, like in the grand scheme of things, we influence yeah. a lot of people, but you're still, you still see yourself as like a small outlet, whatever. And, but I, there was one day where I met three or four clean technical readers on us on a tennis court. in one day, like, oh, like I blew my mind. I was like, yeah. this is unbelievable. Like, it's super cool. like it was pretty wild. And, uh, it, w there was like an era when like you had to go to like us or a few other places for, for news on this. Now it's more challenging because everybody's covering it so it's it's harder to stand out as like the place to go for this you know because every place is the place to go for this yeah but so it is challenging that, the support anyone any support kind of we can get on. yeah to help us you know remain you know uh in this role but but yeah with that and then my final comments you know aside from that funny thing is i i agree i think people have burnout from the level of social media and internet life streaming everything and i think a lot of people have realized it and, and that's my one hope is like social media companies aren't going to solve it but maybe as as you know maybe humans will just get a little bit more like balance with how they approach it but you know i worry like i have you know kids in elementary school who are you know dying for phones and dying to be on the phone and uh and I don't know how how to navigate that because I was never in that fate. I was, you know, we didn't have smartphones when I was a kid. So I, it's really challenging. And and I think, well, will that be like what helps and what hurts in that case? Like, do does it help to get like a lot of exposure to it young and then be like, oh, it's just you know, like and then you know push back and realize, hey, I don't want to live on my phone, or does it help to like to develop the idea like you should like to try to try to develop the idea that you should really only spend a little bit of time on a phone or whatever to have a balanced, good, healthy life. And that there's all this crap on the phone that can influence you. Like it's really hard to navigate with two young girls. And, and this stuff affects girls more than boys, women more than men. Like there's just much more of a, 
of issue with um i mean it affects both gender but i mean everyone but it's just um there's much more of an issue with um women getting self-conscious and so much about imagery and stuff um so it's it's really hard to figure out how how we deal with it but i am hopeful that people realize after a little bit of overexposure you know i want to write on a notebook or i want to read a physical book i want to detach from the phone a bit so i don't know derek what are your final comments and scott if you have any more i think you had final and i have but uh if you had more final comments um uh, I don't but, know if I have anything to add, but I'm just, I feel like, you know, this, like our tagline, the future is now. I'm, uh, I'm actually excited to, like, we know, you know, solar, wind, EVs, e-bikes, what's next? There's stuff that is, you know, emerging, but it's in the lab right now, you know, the super capacitors and, you know, fast charging batteries, but we don't, we don't even know what that is yet, but it has the potential, if it has the potential for the rate of change that we've seen with electric cars, and electric bikes and solar, I mean, it maybe it's going to accelerate. So in five years, the landscape will be unrecognizable. That's my hope, anyway. It just will be the norm. I I 100% agree with you, Derek. And it, it's it's that's one of the really fun things about being the Clean Technica team. We we get to stay on top of this stuff for our job. It's kind of fun. And uh, and I, and I'll I guess I'll just wrap up. You know to 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 dovetail on that, how much things have changed and, and how much things will continue to change. I went to Climate Week for the first time. I'd, I'd never been to a Climate Week conference. Uh, so I went to Climate Week in New York just because I, I happened to be on the East Coast at the time. And uh, seeing the amount of money and investment flowing into climate tech stuff now definitely inspires me to think that no matter what the solutions are, there are going to be lots and lots of solutions that come on rapidly and scale because investors are throwing money at it. VCs are starting to throw money at it. We're starting to see a lot of reasons. Philanthropists are throwing money at it. There was uh, the the anecdote that I like to tell from that from that conference was that back in the early days of Clean Technica, when I would go to a conference, if we got free coffee and bagels. We were pretty excited. It was, it was, that was like, whoa, this conference has a sponsor that gave it, you know, Einstein bagels or whatever. And this one, I don't think I paid for anything. If, if there was, there was amazing cocktails, everything sponsored that there was hors d'oeuvres that were just handed around in trays where people dressed nicely and, you know, all this stuff that I, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a hippie granola guy and like, I'm not really used to going to conferences like that, but this was off the charts i could not believe how much the conference landscape has changed in clean tech since we started and that and it was all good sponsors not a not a lot of bs like you know hydrogen chevron promoting something uh, you know sustainable brands had um bear as their main sponsor of their of their agriculture you know revolution and you know permaculture uh you know section of their of their program last year and people were like don't you guys own monsanto so there was nothing like that. Climate Week was 100% like great sponsors, really cool companies doing really cool things, paying good money to get people in the door to learn about their products. And I think that portends a bright future. Good stuff. Well, it was fun, fun chat flew by sort of like the last 15 years, um, but uh, <laughs> really, really fun stuff. Um, I'm sure a lot more but it was thinking to talk about a lot more and you know there's so many tangents or side stories to go down but uh, i think that was good so um hope people enjoyed it and uh don't forget to subscribe like us uh wherever you're watching or listening whether it's youtube spotify soundcloud um apple itunes uh and uh, hit the bell to, to get notifications for, for new videos or new podcasts and uh thanks for supporting us yeah appreciate it the future is now let's go live it Hi, my name is Scott Cooney. I started Clean Technica to promote clean energy and other sustainable alternatives, and for 13 years, we've been moving markets. If we had a nickel for every time someone told us they bought their first EV, solar, e-bike, or fill-in-the-blank clean energy solution, we'd be a cable TV channel by now. But we don't get those nickels. So unfortunately, we could use your help to reach a few more people. If just 1% of our audience chipped in a few bucks a month, we could hire dozens of great journalists and promote all sorts of climate solutions. It's easy, just go to cleantechnica.com support and sign up with a credit card in seconds. Cancel any time. But we'll be sending out some cool perks too, so I think you'll want to stick around. With your support, we'll keep leading the charge. Thank you so much.